Hey everyone, I'm Hujiwana and this is Space Dock, where today I am talking about some of the peculiar size and scale discrepancies between vehicles that crops up so often in sci-fi. To be clear, I'm not talking about the practicalities of ship size itself, as that is a whole other topic worthy of its own video. So subscribe now if that sounds interesting to you. To start us off, we are going to look at visual effects that used physical miniatures. Now, I love a good miniature in sci-fi, whether it's a bad one or a good one. Bad ones, where it's painfully obvious that it is in fact a miniature, have a special charm to them when the creators had limited budgets but big dreams. Good ones, where you often can't even tell that it's a mini, are on another level as well. The problem here is that the practical realities of filming around physical props mean scale issues between different models are bound to creep in. This was super common on 90s Star Trek, especially with The Defiant. Sometimes it was around its actual size, sometimes it was huge, sometimes it was tiny. But that was also in relation to other ships or even Deep Space Nine itself, which all changed their perceived size a fair bit. As you probably know already, models for visual effects like this were not, and could not, be filmed together at the same time. You're never going to get two models that may very well each be bigger than a person and full of expensive lighting rigs, and try to get them both moving around in the same space together. No studio is going to have the room or equipment that is required to even consider trying that. Not even Christopher Nolan did that, despite his love of getting as many in-camera effects as possible, and as such used a lot of miniatures for Interstellar rather than just pure CGI. For example, the main endurance model was 1 15th scale, so around 4.2 meters in size, while the rangers and landers had 1 to 1 props and 1 15th scale models to match their mothership. But the big docking scene required shots that these models were not appropriate for, so they ended up making a 1 5th scale lander to go with a 1 5th scale chunk of the endurance. What this demonstrates is how models of various scales are used in different ways. Maybe they get filmed with same scale segments of bigger ships. Maybe they only get filmed separately and then the footage gets composited together later. When doing this latter option, it's pretty common for scale to get ignored in favour of other concerns. Perhaps there's a desire to make a certain ship look more interesting from a particular angle, or by doing a particular movement. Maybe the script calls for one ship to chase another, but the two are at such vastly different different sizes, the smaller one would not be visible to audiences viewing on a little 4x3 television in their living rooms. There's also the practical concerns inherent in any production, budget and deadlines. It just might not have been possible to create a battle sequence that would have worked with everything at the correct scale, or there was just simply very little time to get things shot, composited and edited before release. If you have to make 22 weekly episodes, then you have to plan your time out very efficiently. The Defiant in particular though is a bit of a weird one, as it had many other scale and size issues right from inception. Was it a souped up runabout? Was it a battleship? This manifested partly in the scale issues I've already talked about, as if you never solidly nailed down the size for the ship in the first place, how on earth are you supposed to scale it appropriately with others, if indeed you want to bother doing that in the first place? Even something simple like the number of decks the ship had was never consistent, which to be honest is a bit of a Star Trek staple. Yes, the turbo lift jet boot scene in the final frontier is a bit of a goof, but the intent of it was never to show the right number of decks on the ship. The idea was to only show that jet boots go fast by having numbers going up. 99% of the audience wouldn't notice or even care. So if physical props have a lot of baggage with scaling, what about CGI? With CGI, it's possible to put a number of ships together in a potentially infinite space. There's no dealing with studio sizes and equipment, you just drop things in and hit render, right? Well, if anything, all of this freedom that CG allows just makes correct scaling even less attractive. You can fiddle with just a few values, move a few sliders around, and you can scale anything up or down in any axis by any amount with no effort. This is a huge boon for getting just the right shot you want as a director. You can make a ship look really huge and imposing, like Galactica when its massive bulk drops out of FTL into the middle of the fleet. But fiddling around with scale like this can end up being somewhat confusing if done poorly. Is this Kalon ship the size of the Orville, or just equivalent to a shuttle? It's a minor quibble, but still a bit of a head scratcher. It's also possible to go completely overboard with the freedom that CGI allows, such as during the end of Star Trek Discovery Season 3. This scene is supposed to show the inner workings of Discovery as the turbo lifts travel through it, but it's just this nonsensical cityscape environment that could fit the ship within itself many times over. 
It's almost possible to wave off as just an art direction thing, as that season also had funky scales with ships and planets in the same shot. This is absolutely a stylistic choice and I'm fine with it, but the ship interior stuff was a bit of an odd one. Even shows and movies that are fairly good at keeping things scaled correctly, such as Babylon 5, can fall afoul of size problems. I talked about this one a few months ago in a short, but to recap, the stated cannon size of the eponymous station is really only the length of its centrifuge section, thanks to some mild mix-ups behind the scenes that ended up sticking. So sorry for screwing up your station size sheet more or lesser, but the truth had to be known. A similar sort of thing happens in video games as well, as the needs for a clear, readable game typically outweigh getting things technically correct. We've had a lot of Battlestar Galactica deadlock on this channel, both official stats and as cool background footage, but it's a good example of this phenomenon. Some ships are just bigger or smaller compared to others than they should be, and this is likely for gameplay purposes. For example, the Orion class is supposed to be around 400 meters, but in-game it's on par with the supposedly 600 meter Manticore and 650 meter Valkyrie. This happens a lot in other genres too, for reasons similar to those I gave for CGI. When you don't need to have a ship's interior match its exterior, even if you can move between them, then all sorts of peculiar things can happen. For example, Warframe's railjacks are wildly different in size between the inside and outside because the interior needed to be a playable space. If the outside matched that, then it would be gigantic in the dry dock and other spaces, and if the interior matched the outside, then it would be very small and awkward to traverse. The game does have space magic if you really felt like trying to justify this, but it's not particularly needed. Another third person game that does this is Mass Effect. The Normandy is a brilliant spacecraft, and I'm sure you already know the interior doesn't match the exterior, but did you also realise the model shown in docking bays is absolutely tiny? Much like with the Railjack, a full scale Normandy would just not fit into the docking bays without rebuilding them entirely, which may not have been possible. There may have been technical reasons or art direction reasons, or even both, preventing the docking bays being that scale due to being released early in the Xbox 360's lifespan. You see, early on in a console's lifespan, developers can struggle to get everything they want to fit on screen. As they get more experienced, they can do all sorts of crazy optimization things, which is why you end up with a massive impressive docking bay in the Citadel DLC for Mass Effect 3. It's amazing that both of these are on the same console! So rather than trying to make big docks and risking bugs, bad performance or just a more ugly environment, they made the Normandy small, and most people would never even notice due to the player being kept just far enough away that it's not super obvious. Overall, is correct spacecraft scaling really that important? I think that comes down to the preferences of the creator of whatever the ships are in, as there are just so many other considerations like specific art direction, clarity or more practical things like deadlines. That said, while often people won't notice or won't care, sometimes the issues can be so jarring it can detract from the rest of the content, though thankfully this is very rare. So be careful when making your own spaceship art, but understand you don't need to be super strict with scaling unless you really want to. If you enjoyed this look at spacecraft scaling issues, please leave a like and subscribe for that future video on vessel size and other related content. You can support the channel directly here on YouTube by giving us super thanks or by becoming a channel member. You can also join our Patreon like these wonderful people on screen. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.